recently from New York Spinal Hospital. I'm your surgeon, but we deal with uh, some uh, interventional uh, cardiologists because most of our patients they are really uh, uh, aging, and elderly, and uh, they have uh, difficult problems. So we need to have some assessment. We have, uh, I can say, it is not publicity. We have excellent, uh, uh, I mean, angiography lab with the uh, bike lane, with all the technology we need. And uh, the uh, cardiologist preferred to do it on site. But he said he is an interventional cardiologist, again from the state. Again, he is board certified as an inter interventional cardiologist. But the problem with the DHA, they need cover with a cardiac surgeon in case of possible complication. Okay. But we know that some other hospitals in Dubai and in the country, they have interventional cardiology practice, and they don't have cardiac surgeon. And we are in the same city, we are not far from the city. We can get cover from any of the other hospitals available in the city. And that will open the possibility for many patients to be treated on site. Okay, and that's... There is no risk? The, the risk is minimal for the... Okay, for diagnostic is nearly nil. Uh, nowadays, again, with the, uh, with the NGO. But for interventional, there is a risk always, but it is minimal, okay, and in experience it has. And the uh, risk, uh, again, when the procedure is done, the patient can be transferred and, uh, very fast to uh, another hospital. There had to be an agreement with this hospital that they need to cover this facility, okay, for uh, possible complication. Or well, maybe the that can be called. There are international standards for this. When the interventional cardiology started, we used to have a cardiac surgeon sitting in the cath lab. Then, because the procedures tend to be more and more safe and they accumulated more data to support the safety of the procedure, the rules relaxed a little bit. Now, uh, my understanding is that this process of procedure is allowed to be done as long as there is a cardiac surgeon who is on standby. It's not all COVID. He knows that this procedure is happening at the Mural Spinal Hospital, and if you need a section of any complication takes place, the patient should be, should be uh, transferred to the other facility within 30 minutes. If that facility is available, uh, then I think we'll get the customer to sign on that. He accepts yeah, this situation. Oh, nobody would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be Your Excellency, uh, thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to uh, to meet with you, and, and thank you, Ms. Leila. Uh, I said to His Excellency yesterday, I think uh, he has the most difficult job in Dubai in terms of regulating the, the healthcare sector and, and in terms of looking at the you know, I think many of us have experience of, of medical inflation in other in other parts of the world, perhaps. And the biggest driver of inflation, as far as we're concerned, is utilisation. I mean, the utilisation in Dubai is obviously driving healthcare costs to go up. We have an ageing population. Uh, we see that with the since the Arab Spring, people are living here longer, which means that people are getting older, which means they spend more on healthcare. There's disease profiles that are prevalent here in terms of lifestyle diseases which pushes up price, etc. So I understand that all of these push up the cost of healthcare, but it also pushes up our costs simultaneously because obviously the more people utilize our healthcare facilities, the more we need to add people and increase our costs to be able to accommodate it. So to manage the price by, by saying, look, you need to just have an X percentage increase actually doesn't stop the prices from going up because the prices are going up because of other factors. What it does to us, though, as a, as a provider, is it makes it very difficult for us to be able to afford to accommodate these changes. Uh, our biggest cost driver is, is salaries, and uh, uh, I mean, that has a massive impact on us in terms of, of our overall costs. And this, this competition coming into the marketplace, specifically Abu Dhabi, who, who at Cleveland Hospital, I'm sure many of us have felt of, of lured many of our, our people across, we can't prevent that. But we need to be able to accommodate the increase in the, in the cost of living index with our own people. And medical inflation is significantly higher than inflation, if you look at all the research around the world. And I'd just like to get His Excellency's views on this, please. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, <clears throat> this year also suffering the same. I'm sure, yeah. As we have uh, you know, the trauma for, for the whole UAE, actually, not only Dubai, and other uh, services and hospitals. We do have the same. Just I left. 
my uh, board meeting with the same issues that we are talking about. Actually, you know, when you talk about the system in general, we need to think about bringing the system uh, to the international standard with you know, what we came up with is regulating the prices but not uh, you know, controlling the prices. And uh, in any system, I think uh, many parts of the world, they do have index of inflation. And that's why we are using the uh, weight statistics uh, department index of inflation to be the limit of this inflation. We're not saying don't increase. But if we leave it just like that, open as many of unsuccessful uh, market in the health uh, sector, they didn't succeed because there's no regulation. It's just random. And uh, that, I think, is unhealthy you know, for the sector. So we decided, as a government, to do that sort of regulation. And anyone has the right to uh, put forward, you know, because the, the insurance comes on board and it will guarantee the flow of uh, the finance around. In the meantime, that got to be, you know, reasonably uh, regulated. And that's why we established the baseline now, which was not there before. And the increase is allowed, but with a certain uh, Parameters and the index will be the inflation index that issued annually by the uh, the West Statistics uh, Department, which takes everything you know, the, all the, the life uh, expenses in consideration. Now, Your Excellency, I think we we not again we, we work in markets where there's price regulation. We have no we have no problem with that. I think the the challenge for us is is in terms of the process to get to that, and uh, and and the timing of it as well. Uh, most of us work. In January is, is when we you know we go with our tariff increases. Most of us budget starts there, and uh, to, to to announce it two weeks ago, it sort of has a major impact on us. And what we have found is that the the medical insurance is what I like about Dubai is it's a very competitive medical insurance market, unlike Abu Dhabi where there's basically one payer, and they have actually in a way controlled price because they will argue with you. They will say no. This one will say yes. And they have controlled price in terms of tariff increases. But the biggest cost driver is not that tariff increase. The biggest cost driver is other factors. But that tariff increase has the biggest impact on our business because it determines what we can pay our staff, if we can afford to expand, if we can afford to invest. That is actually, I mean, for us, if we don't get a tariff increase, it has a 20 to 30% impact on our profits. That's how significant it is for us. Actually, you know, the how you have, we are open it until November, you know, from January to November, you can put forward the request to increase the prices. So, 11 months. No, 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 we, we, we did put, for, for, no. the announcement came out for 2015. Okay, this is the beginning, maybe, you know, for sure, in any system like this, I'm sure it's not always to be, for sure there is issues to be considered, and to, be, you know, we can improve, you know, and, uh, there are a number of issues that, 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 that are worthwhile discussing, but from the point of view of regulation, what I'd like to better understand is how we, again, from a collaborative point of view, which is the most important thing here, interact properly when we're dealing with regulatory issues, whether it's disciplinary issues, malpractice issues, and so on. At the moment, what happens, we have a request from the DHA to receive a file. When that happens, we have no understanding, perhaps, of what the issues are. We send the file away. We have acknowledgement of the receipt of the file. Then the file comes back, but we don't get the feedback. To make it a meaningful process from a point of view of furthering patient safety and increasing and improving quality, we need to understand how we can collaborate more on achieving that, because it's very much a two-way thing, I believe. Yes, we do send these emails, as you mentioned, but if you think that we can uh, be a more, uh, more clarification in this issue, we can always send you the complaint letter with the request, so that we're going to I do think that. I think so. that's helpful, and also sure. what I, li I like to try and do as well when I receive this is give some indication as to what we have already done internally in the way of risk management. Most of us have a, a, a good governance process in place where we're looking at clinical outcomes and so on, and we're having sort of reporting processes. So in most situations, we've already started that process of review, and again, we can share that information with you, which is helpful, I think, to you to then understand what's going on. Sure, we can send always the complaint letter and more clarification. No?